What's up, everyone? Before we get into it, I have some free tickets to give away. I have two sets of tickets to uh, Saturday, July 20th at the Voodoo Room. That is inside the House of Blues in San Diego. It's Death Lens, Strawberry Fuzz, Grave Secrets, and... Dude, show up early because the best band is playing first. It's Big Attitude, one of my favorite new bands out of San Diego. Handle business. You can shoot me an email, 185 miles south at gmail.com. First two people to email me with your full name, you get the tickets. So uh, handle business, 185 miles south at gmail.com. Death Lens, Strawberry Fuzz, Grave Secrets, and Big Attitude going down at the Voodoo Room in the House of Blues Saturday, July 20th. 2024 and let's get on with the show 185 miles south.com smash that patreon button One hundred and eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. What's up, everyone? We are back and talking hardcore, helping out. You know him. You love him. It is the best dressed man of the pod. It is Daniel Sant. What's up, Dan? This is how it feels to be lonely. This is how it feels to be small. Well, Jesus, I guess I'll just go stick my head in an oven, huh? You know, just a little in spiral carpets for the the squadron. (laughs) That's right. All right, dude, let's jump right into punk and hardcore. Uh, We are at like the halfway mark for the year. I wanted to do a quick check in of the stuff that we have liked the most uh, throughout the year so far. Dan, kick it off. What's your favorite stuff of 2024 so far? Okay, so just came up with like a small list. Like there is a lot of good stuff this year, but it is interesting that in the past we have we have talked about maybe this year isn't hitting as hard, but I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what the rest of 2024 has to offer. But my favorite so far, Dynamite, Blow the Bloody Doors Off EP. The Chisel, What a Fucking Nightmare, LP. Lost Legion, Behind the Concrete Veil, LP. Asbo, The Demo, 2024. Neutrals, <laughs> Newtown Dream, LP. Split System, Volume 2, LP. Kriegsog, Love and Revenge, LP. The Face the Pain, Demo. The No Idols, Demo. Ikhras, <laughs> oh God. Uh, Jahanan Bistana demo and uh, Bootlicker A Thousand Yard Stair LP. Yeah, you know, I don't know if we could call it like this year is that great because I was thinking about that. It's like how much good shit has to come out for you to consider it a good year. And really, it's like if you have something that you really like that comes out every other month that you're going to stick with listening to like that's a pretty good year and we both have 11 things that we're calling out here and there's plenty more right like i didn't put the echo chamber on my list like i like that a lot but yeah let's get into it we have four things that are the same the split system volume 2 lp the no idols the demo uh from this year the chisel what a fucking nightmare lp and then uh dude brand new that ass bow demo 24 Dude, that yeah. thing rips. And uh, hopefully someone gets it on streaming soon. It's just ASBO and it is on Bandcamp. But, uh, dude, handle business, people. Get it on streaming and, do this thing rips, dude. Plus, it's fun as hell to say ASBO, you know? <laughs> What's up? Antisocial behavior order. That's right. So if you live in England, I guess you know what it means. But uh, for the rest of us, it's just a sick-ass name, ASBO. All right. The other things I got, uh, Bloodstains, the self-titled LP. And I did see that that just got a second press. So handle business people get that. Also, I think that I saw Sorry State had some of the Euro version in their uh, distro. So that thing sold quick. I was lucky I got a copy. Uh, Shout out to Bedge for grabbing one for me at the record release. But uh, yeah, so handle business get that. The Collateral, we still know 7-inch. Dude, 
for Roots Hardcore, about as good as it gets for uh, this year. That Public Acid, Deadly Struggle LP, we talked it a bunch on the pod. Love this thing. The En La Muerte, self-titled 7-inch. I absolutely love this thing. We talked it on the pod. Canal Irreal, hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, Someone Else's Dance LP. Uh, we talked that last month with Chris on the episode. The Burning Lord Arcane Demolition LP. We talked that early in the year. Love that thing. Can't wait to get it in the mail. Uh, the Invertebrates Sick to Survive LP. We are going to talk this week on the pod. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Pretty good so far, dude. I don't know. That split system was so early in the year. I'm still jamming it. That collateral we still know is like one of the better Roots Hardcore records that's come out in the last few years. That An La Muerte band, a band that's been around for under a year, put out like, I don't know, it's like a nine song, seven inch. Every single song rips like, dude, that's kind of all I need. You know, the chisel coming with a second really good LP. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, uh, I mean, what's really cool is everything that's on your list that's not on mine, I easily could have. You know, it's just the next tier down for me. Like, I like all that stuff so much, you know. The the one that's that we've never even mentioned, I don't think, on the pod is the Neutrals. That band is from uh, Oakland, and they're like a um, – almost like the television personalities if they were on Sarah Records and, and uh, were a punk band in 1976. I don't know. They're really great. But that split system, God, that is just – it, I just keep going back to it, you know? It's so good, dude. It's so good. Also, that Kriegshog record that you called out, that thing kicks so much ass. Um, yeah. And we never got around to talking to it. Although, I got to say, dude, that first riff on the last song of that record might win Riff of the Year. So it's I so I haven't cool. heard I haven't heard anything that's like gotten close to it, you know? So yeah, that's going to be definitely in the running. We will see when we send off that... Uh, Voting sheet to the elites, the 185 elites, what they decide. Let's jump in to uh, the new stuff. Before we get going, just wanted to run through some shout outs of newer stuff. Of course, that ass bow uh, <laughs> demo that we've been talking about. That it's one is mentioned. Asbo. Asbo. Hey, it's ass bow to me, dude. I know. So, uh, I know. That's why you just keep <laughs> randomly texting it. Ass bow. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love it, dude. They're my favorite band. All right. Shout out to Intercom. This is a San Diego hardcore band. They just put out an EP, The Sound of Self-Destruction. It's out digitally now. The 7 inch will be out on Under the Gun Records soon. The Dudes from uh, Ventura County, Charman, 805 Scene Vets. They just put out another LP. I believe it's the third LP, uh, Down on Ready. It is out digitally, and uh, hopefully there's vinyl soon because I love this thing. I like I like Charman song by song, but what I really like is listening to the whole record on vinyl at my pad. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be one of those first 10 orders when that hits. Uh, the band Affliction, this is the 805 Straight Edge Band. Dan, time for you to check it out. Uh, they put out an EP. I believe it's digital only, Unending Conflict. So uh, handle business people. Although, you know what, dude? The bad thing about having your band name Affliction, there's no way I'm wearing a fucking shirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they should lean into that it should be all like straight edge filigree and and fleur de lis with x's <laughs> that's right it's like just bust out the the most douchebag mma shirts ever for uh your band so uh, what are you gonna do um also tarina dude this is very oxnard heavy what's up tarina just put out a new song called false compassion it goes hard as fuck and uh, I cannot wait for the new record on Days. By the time this airs, they will have smashed it at Sound and Fury. So uh, handle business. Get on that Tarina bandwagon. You know what's up. All right. There's a band called Problems. They put out an EP called Beg for Release. They're out of Oslo, Norway. Uh, it is on Adult Crash Records, which I believe is out of Denmark. Not sure. Dude, someone get this in your US distro. I would like to purchase it, please. Um, okay, there's a band called The Massacred. They put out an EP called Death March. It's their second 7-inch. It came out on Active 8 Records. It is not streaming anywhere. There's just two songs on YouTube. Dude, this thing is so good. And I don't know what kind of bullshit marketing scheme that is to just put two songs on YouTube and like not have it on Bandcamp. But it fucking worked. And I ordered the thing. So what's up? But like, can we get the whole thing on streaming? What the fuck is going on here? I gotta say. Um, I gotta say, you know it must be great if you are going to YouTube to check this out. 
I know. I've listened to it like five times on YouTube, like the two songs. You know, it's like, can I get the rest of it? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it rips. It rips like really hard. And I'd never heard of them before. The previous 7-inch, I found it, and uh, I enjoy it too. But these two new songs, god damn, what's up? All right. Finally, this is a Rob Moran find, a band called Hellscape out of the UK. They just put out a self-titled 7-inch on Advanced Perspective. And uh, actually, they put out a the seven inch came out on a different label, but Advanced Perspective has it in their U.S. distro. So if you check that out, if you like it, you can get it through Advanced Perspective. If you live in the states, and uh, otherwise, Hellscape self titled, look it up. I think it came out in the U.K., so uh, get it there if you live abroad. Uh, and everyone, one hundred eighty five miles south dot com. Click that playlist link at the top of the page, or just find us on Spotify. There is a playlist for every episode. You can check out the stuff we talk about. So you don't got to rewind and try to write it down real quick or whatever. Okay, let's get into it. Dan, the first thing I want to talk about is the Invertebrae's Sick to Survive LP. It came out on Beach Impediment in May of 2024. And it finally got up on Spotify. So we're going to talk about it. Because, uh, you know, at some point, we're probably going to have to break that rule. A lot of people listen to this podcast that, you know, they casually dabble in this music now. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that they listen to, they get the wrecks from us, you know, and I just I like to have it easy for everyone to be able to just check out the stuff we talk about, you know, instead of like, all right, we talked about this, but you got to hunt it down on YouTube. And we talked about this, but it's only on Bandcamp. We talked about this. You got to find one of your pirate friends to download it for you on SoulSeek. And this one's on Spotify and this one's on Apple Music. The shit is fucking annoying. You know, what I mean, like. Spotify blows overall, you know, like they got us, right? We're renting music. It's fucking obscene, but dude, it's just easy, right? So like for people that don't have a, have a ton of time to like, you know, curate a musical library and then like load it onto their phone or their old ass iPod, it's just nice. So, uh, yeah, it's just a, a little service we do for the people for the one eight five people. What's up? Okay. Let's get into it. Dan, what were your thoughts on this thing? This thing is um it rips right out the right out the gate like absolutely crushes but with more listens it gets better and better and better so this is like a band that is doing like roots esque how would you do, what what lane would you say this hardcore is in just straight up hardcore with flourishes i would say like fast yeah. hardcore with flourishes. It's 1984 US hardcore, but it's like through a modern lens. So you're going to compare it to like the direct controls, the government warnings, like the bands like that, right? Absolutely. And and so when I say with flourishes, I'm saying like the guitar players are doing very tuneful or almost like solo-y things just to really elevate the riff, where the riff would be like just a very good amazing straightforward like like zach says 84 style hardcore riff um that's blistering pace like it is so fast um the drummer is exceptional and the way the drums are recorded are exceptional too the recording in general is amazing the thing where this this band is is with all the flourishes the vocalist is giving you like straight over the plate 100 mile an hour fastball like just the perfect like you can't fuck with it because it's a hundred miles an hour, but it is just straightforward delivery in such a great way that it's not um it's not boring and it is not um so wacky that it's pulling you in another direction. Sometimes that's great because that's what adds a lot of character, but this is just like these are the perfect way to sing over this fast songs, you know, and his voice is great. Dude, he sounds like Ian. He straight up does like originally I was like, okay, like it just sounded like a normal hardcore voice. And the more and more I listened to it, it's like, dude, he sounds like fucking Ian. Like when it's all the way, like the vocal cords stretched, you know what I mean? And he doesn't have like the dynamics. He doesn't go like soft to loud. Like Ian does. Obviously Ian Mackay, one of the best hardcore singers of all yeah. time, right? No. This 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 dude's doing Ian on 10 the whole time. And it sounds ridiculous to say it. You know, you don't want to get compared to like one of the goats. But like, dude, when I go into my bullshit, take a quick listen and you can come back in and tell me if I'm smoking crack. Yeah, well, I, I, 
I feel like now that you say that, I I would say like a part of Ian going like, did you fucking get it? Like that kind of. Yes, when my, Ian's all the way on life. 10, right? Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I will re-listen with that like as a lens. But I mean, there are some like incredible songs. It starts out with that No More. Just so good. Um, well, I, I mean, it's really hard to pick anything out. The song "Shit Pit" with the um, the the riff on that song being so almost would you say like DK? Um, totally. I don't know. And the song "Bastardized" um, is just so catchy. It's just so catchy. Like um, for being such <laughs> the word "bastardized" being screamed like gets under your skin and you're like bastardized <laughs> like just singing along it's great it's a fantastic uh lp yeah i ordered it i think it's great i'm so glad it's on streaming for everyone now but yeah so the first thing that i thought of when i started listening to it was okay this is so good it's roots hardcore it's modern so like your brain just goes to like like i said the direct controls the government warnings like that like era and genre of band but like there's two things like, first of all, the riffing reminds me a lot of like that last Totalitar record, which kind of sounds weird to say, but like the left hand is very savage, you know, and then I just started thinking like, so some of these dudes are also in that public acid band. And I was like, you know what? Half these songs just sound like they could be public acid songs, but just instead of having that super savage sound, like that HM2 sounding sound, they're just playing through a fucking Marshall stack. Dude, it's true. Like if you listen to like Lost Illusion, Sterilized Decay or Bastardized, like those are public acid ass riffs. <laughs> like if you just shoot it through a HM2, like it's a public acid song. And in my opinion, that's like a good thing. Like it's showing that like a great hardcore song is in the song. It's not in the recording. And so different bands can make different production and sonic choices to how they want to present their band. But like, if you don't have the fucking songs, your band sucks. You know what I mean? And these dudes have now done it like in this band, like a fully like stripped down roots, hardcore band and in, you know, a burly ass true punks band. But yeah, Dan, you called out the drumming. It is so exceptional. You know what I mean? And, and you have to have it right in a roots hardcore band and i love when the dude goes from like the open hi-hat to the closed hi-hat like he does it on that laughing system song like halfway through he also does it on the intro of climb the ranks when he's doing that closed hi-hat because he's such a good drummer the song just sounds so fast in that like early early 80s way that like never got replicated because for whatever reason like the way that they recorded the hi-hat in the early 80s is just fucking magical you know what i mean it's touched by the hands of the gods you know and then like at some point recordings changed and like the hi-hat never sounded so magical again the last thing i want to say on this is dan talked about shit pit having like that kind of dk that short intro dead kennedy's ass intro at the end of Bated Breath and Humid Crypt, they do some kind of like post-punk death rock sounding like guitar hooks. And it is so good when they yeah. mix that into like this style. And like, I really think if they could somehow tuck more of that shit in on the next record, but still like maintain this level of intensity you'd be looking at like an all time Ruth's hardcore record, like all time, all time. So that's how much I love this thing. And uh, yeah. Uh, any final thoughts, Dan? Yeah. That, that's kind of just what I was talking about. The flourishes, like the unexpected left turn riffs that are going at the ends of these, or they'll just be a little add on, you know, to, to a riff. And it's just, it's just really great because it, it, it takes you, you know, it's it just gives you something more. It shows creativity. It's a great LP. Definitely check it out. Hell yeah. Okay, let's go into the next one we're going to talk about. We're going to talk Bootlicker. Thousand Yard Stare came out on Neon Taste Records in May of 2024. Danny chose this one. Get into it. Yeah, so um, Canada's uh, single coil stompers are back. You know, we loved their uh, LP before this. It's giving you that 
when we you know we talk about single coil it's so it's not like chunky chunky guitar but it is more on the high end um really ramped up like where it's the marshmallow is almost falling off the stick in the treble world but it's not quite and the way that this band does it perfectly by matching that like imagine if someone in the saints was like <laughs> just kicked in the head by Vinny stigma and like just started playing that style of guitar but like riffing like that but the way that this band balances it so good is that the rhythm section is just so stompy and so like almost oi throughout. Um, so good. And the um, vocals are really just perfectly in the mix. Like a lot of the time, like I think, I think one of our critiques of this LP before this is that the vocal was too buried. I think we said that for the first LP and it's, it's a, an opinion that I hold a little bit, whereas I feel they're really good in this and they're delivered in such a almost discharge way, like lyrically and, and delivery because they, they're not all over the song all the time. And they're just the punctuation points with the just simplicity of the, like take the first song for example you yeah. like it ends with you are state property it just it just punctuates perfectly uh, the third song canon fodder also gives you those vibes and i believe they've done submission part 1 submission part 2 and they close this record with submission part 3 and it is such a banger and what i love like with both um the Invertebrates and the Bootlicker LP. These two records are not just front loaded. Like sometimes when we're reviewing um, modern hardcore LPs, especially in the streaming age, like bands will kind of like, oh, well, these are our four best songs. Let's just have them at the front of the record. I like that both these records have really good flow throughout. The song Billionaire Bunker into that song Red Surge. Um, obviously, I'm only listening to this on um, streaming, so I don't know if those are either sides of the record or not. But they um, go really well together. I, I really, um, I really like the way this band approaches doing like hardcore because punk is so at the root of what this band is putting forward. But they're playing absolutely stomping, fast as hell and great hardcore so it's like giving me everything i want it's interesting they called you called out discharge because the backbone of this band is they're a db band you know yeah. but like they're a they're a unique take on it it's like db meets uk 82 and with an interesting tone right the so first off, before I get into this like i just want to say this band kicks ass right and generally that's all i look for in a band you know, and like they did it again. They put out another 12 inch. The whole thing kicks ass. They don't ever take the pedal off the metal on this at all. So like, I don't know. That's like a real accomplishment, you know, another 12 inch that just straight rips. But getting into like comparing this one to the last one, which is maybe not fair, but it's just kind of what we do. Um, the last one was so unique in the recording because you know, Dan talked about like the single coil guitar and what we're describing is like, it's just a guitar with very little distortion on it. You know, it's kind of twangy, you know, but then behind that is like this heavy ass bass that's very distorted. And that like the juxtaposition of those two different sounds was very unique, especially because they sounded so far apart. You could kind of pick them out from each other. If you like listened closely on this record, everything sounds very compressed. So it's different. It's not a bad thing. Like Dan said, like maybe the vocals are mixed better on this record. Maybe everything's mixed better on this record. Like maybe the mix is so sick that like that's kind of why you get so much compression. But that bass and the guitar, they kind of got compressed into sounding like just a fuzzy guitar, you know, which again is cool. I like fuzzy guitar, but it kind of lost a little bit of that uniqueness the last record had. But yeah, it kicks ass. The other thing is 
this band is pretty monotone, which again leads to them kicking ass right the whole way through. Like it's just it's kind of an ass beater the whole way through. But in a monotone band, like you kind of like rely on having like the mid tempo bangers. In going back to other DB stuff, you know, when we talk about discharge, it's like they're known for you know the DB songs, but it kind of seems like every time we have to choose the best discharge songs, we're always choosing the mid tempo ones, right? Because like they stand out. They're like the the mid tempo bangers that cut up the records. And if you think about the the last bootlegger record, there was I believe there was three uh mid tempo bangers on that and they were kind of like dispersed throughout the record on this one i think just song number one and five are mid tempo bangers so i love dan that you called out the sixth and seventh song as like your favorite like run and then also that you called out the last song on the record because to my ears like this is kind of front loaded in the way that you know mid tempo banger in the one and five slots so like those first five songs flow together more for me than the back end of the record is maybe a little, it, it feels a little samey to me, you know, but yeah, I I've listened to it three times, maybe on, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh, listen, like the songs will stand out a little more, but I think that like what makes this record so good is also the thing that makes it not super stand out to me, which is every song kicks ass. You know what I mean? Every song is like dragging you over the coals, like giving it to you. Right. But like, you know, it doesn't have those highs and lows. And like, if they just tucked in like a couple choruses that were like trying to be like the partisans, you know, or if they tucked in like a couple little guitar leads that sounded like criminal damage, like then you're talking, you know, one of my favorite bands, you know what I mean? But otherwise this is like just a band that they're going to play a ripping set. You want to drink beer and slam and like, fuck, that's what I was looking for, for a lot of my life. You know what I mean? But like, it it's not something that I'm looking to necessarily like put on the turntable right now. Well, those are completely valid um, critiques because in my little notes here, I have, but where are the like true stomping mid temp mid tempo bangers? Like it, that is um, something that the last LP and the, the other thing that you brought up that I didn't really think of because I just enjoyed this in its own right. I do miss the twang, the almost like fucking country esque twang that the the guitar had, which made it so unique on the first one. This one it is just like revved up so high, so it is still a very unique guitar sound. But yeah, you bringing that back up, that's really what set that um, first LP aside was that it wasn't as revved up as this and it, it was still aggressive. Dan, I think what that is, is just on the last record, it's not as compressed. So the bass and the guitar, there's a gap between them, you know, and on this one, they're kind of like sucked together. So they don't have the two unique tones. It's harder to differentiate on this one, like where the bass ends and where the guitar begins. It's kind of sucked into one sound that you're getting hit with. Yeah. Or they could have just even used a different, amp they could have been just using one of those tiny little like square vintage amps on the last one that was just giving the guitar so much more um thing and if they're using something a little bit beefier this time it's just blending into the the bass now big and beefy dude respect <laughs> <laughs> these minor critiques aside it is still a absolute killer lp Dan did say that he almost killed himself by moshing into the shower while this was playing. So there's that. I'm taking it back to the old school because I'm an old fool. I'm taking it back to the old school because I'm an old fool. All right, we are going old school. We are going to talk the shit lickers out of Gothenburg, Sweden. They're seven inch from 1982 titled GBG 1982. Uh, they put it out themselves as any self-respecting hardcore band does. And uh, I'm going to set myself up to get crucified. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Swedish punk and hardcore. And uh, a lot of people that love international hardcore are some snobby ass motherfuckers. So if I get something wrong, blame Staffen. <laughs> it is what it is. All right. In the 1970s, of course, Sweden had punk bands like everyone else, right? Like punk blew up. There were punk bands everywhere. You know what I mean? And 
a few of the bigger ones that I called out and I'm going to pronounce these all wrong. So whatever, but there was a band called Ebba Grown and they sounded like a 77 style meets New York dolls. You had another one called KSBM and their LP was very strange. You know, some of it is 77 punk. Some of it is like straight up rock and roll. And then dude, there's a song on there. That's like a straight piano lounge song. So, you know, in the seventies, like punk was weird, dude. You know, sometimes it was straightforward and ripping and sometimes like they went off on weird tangents. Right. And uh, so you get a lot of that. There's a lot of bang for your buck on the KSBM record. There's also a band called Mass Media and they sounded like very typical, like 70s killed by death style lo-fi punk. And the reason why I want to call them out is because they break up in 1980 and then a couple of those dudes in 1981 start a band called the Head Cleaners. Actually, it's Head Cleaners. I think there's no the. It's just hard to say Head Cleaners. Anyway, Head Cleaners, they put out a ripping 7-inch in 1981 that's like just straight up stripped down 1981 hardcore. Like if you played it back to back with SOA, it's not that different. And so I think that they're a perfect example of kind of that changing of the tide from that original punk stuff to when hardcore just kind of takes over the world in 81. You got to remember, Discharge did a bunch of 7 Inches, did a few 7 Inches in 1980. GBH does their first EP in 1980, I believe. And then, you know, you have the Teen Idols in the US and stuff's taking off. Circle Jerks, Bad Brains, Let's Go. You know what I mean? So here is that band, Mass Media, switching over and putting out a straight-up hardcore record that's really good. Everyone should check it out. Uh, it'll be in the sub stack that comes out tomorrow. Um, okay. So in 1982, you get this seven inch that we're going to talk about today. This shit liquor seven inch. You also get the first anti C mix seven inch anti C mix for Staffen. Um, but that first anti C mix seven inch is, it's more just straightforward, hardcore, like the, uh, like the head cleaners record, but this shit liquor seven inch is straight up raw punk. You know what I mean? Like this is full on discharge sounding hardcore punk. So it's notable because it's the first uh, Swedish record that sounds like that. And like from this point on, Sweden would be one of the regions, you know, along with Japan, you know, and the UK that like do this style, like they're the masters of the style, right? So it's very notable in that regard. And then also, this is the only record that this band ever puts out. They break up. And then the next year, uh, the bass player of this band, the Shitliggers, joins Anti CMX as the singer. And they put out their seven inch raped ass, which is full on raw punk. And uh, that's going on, right? Also in 83, that band Mob 47, they put out their demo. So now you have Anti CMX, Mob 47, both playing that raw punk style. And then in 84, you get the second or the third anti CMX seven inch, the second of like that raw style, and you get the classic Mob Forty Seven seven inch that comes out that year, and then the rest is history. I'm not going to talk it, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little context of like where this shit liquor seven inch is in uh, the pantheon. Dan, what are your thoughts about it? First of all, shit liquors, right? Is that is that like um? Obviously, it's probably a take off of shit kickers, but is someone who's a shit liquor? Are they like a ass kisser or something i don't know the did name? i drop didn't i drop enough facts you gotta you gotta get me on a you gotta get me on a gotcha question oh um, it's not a gotcha question i'm just like <laughs> just like a a funny thing when like obviously when you hear punk band names you just go oh yeah the blah blah blahs but when you actually zone in on what the words mean you're like hmm licking shit yeah yeah is this like the king ass kisser maybe yeah exactly he's just got his tongue so far up there That's anyway right. um yeah this is so ripping this um do you know what's funny is like on our little like listening playlist of going from the bootlicker into this it's like the perfect like transition do you know what i mean like it's just the same like pace but this has just got so much grit so much like um absolute authenticity of it being like original and not trying to be something else to an extent obviously they're influenced by their peers what what are your favorite songs on this because uh, that would be interesting to compare and contrast because i i really love um 
obviously the first song War Sisters. I mean, I like all four songs to be to be <laughs> truthful, but um I think side B has side A on this one. Dan, I think they're out of order on the Spotify. So oh, shit. <laughs> I, I wouldn't side A and side B it. But dude, the answer is I like all four of them. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what makes it so great. And but if I had to choose my favorite one, leader of the fucking assholes. I yeah, dude same. I it's one of the greatest songs of all time. Like, especially did you get a chance to look at the lyrics? Um, no, I didn't. Okay. Dude, this this song has two lines that they just repeat three times. It just says, yeah. Who tells the cunts to do what they do? The leader of the fucking assholes. <laughs> it's like, okay, fucking perfect. Blast the yeah. shit at every fucking state leader's funeral until the end of time. You know what I mean? But yeah, this this band, like, I've always kind of used them as they're like the ultimate gatekeep band of the true punks, right? Like, like you just think about a snobby punk dude that's like, oh, that guy's a fucking poser. He doesn't even know about the shit lickers. You know what I mean? And also, I think that the name, like, kind of kept me away from, like, acknowledging the greatness of this thing. You know what I mean? But, uh... Dude, I got to say the Taco Bell sponsorships and the fucking PBR bullshit and the, you know, $35 shirts and shows. Maybe they drove me to the arms of the shit lickers. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I've come around to acknowledge how great this thing is. And if I redid my 80s list, it's making the top 100 for sure. And it's probably making the top 50. And that leader of the fucking asshole song. I mean, dude. It's pretty perfect. If you think about this record, four songs in three minutes and to have none of them be filler, that's pretty amazing. And also like to be so stripped down and monotone, but to have every single song be catchy, even the song sung in Swedish, you know, Sprakta, 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 Snut, Skala, like, okay. Cracked, yeah. <laughs> crack schools. You know what I mean? Like it's great. War system, war system, war system now. Dude, you listen to it two times, you fucking know it. Who yeah. tells the cunts to do what they do? The leader of the fucking assholes. Like, okay, it's perfect. And like, the more you dial into it, the more you can appreciate the simplicity and the more you understand that replicating simplicity is the most impossible thing to do. Like, it is so hard to do a stripped down band like this and have it be spectacular and good because generally it'll just come off generic and cheesy or people are going to try to butter it up and make it fancy. And it's not going to rip like the stripped down version, right? This is so wild and so perfect. And I don't know. I just, I wanted to talk it. And the other thing is dude, the shit lickers are on Spotify. So if you think your band is too punk to like go on streaming, talk it out with them. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Have you ever, have you ever heard of PBG uh, pink bandana guy? from back in the day at San Diego shows? No. Okay, so there was this borderline lunatic that was like a, from Eastern Europe, didn't know anyone, used to come with a pink bandana on, like, but tied in the, like, I don't know, Mike Judge way. Okay. You know, like, a, and he would just come and, like, circle pit like crazy. And we always used to call him PBG, and he'd just be just, he's a true punk like was there just for the music not to like meet up with anyone he was just there to fucking pit Hell right yeah. we used to call him pbg he had a shit lickers patch so let's, just, <laughs> let's just give respect dude respect to that dude straight up yeah i don't know i love this thing dan final thoughts hardcore is alive and well check out the list that we both put of our favorite things of the year so far and get in the comments telling us things that you've enjoyed uh just as much or if you've checked out any of that stuff and tell us your opinions on it but please uh hip us to new stuff all the time we love you and and we love the patreons yeah and if you're doing a band try to write a chorus better than armed revolution fuck them all fucking shit you can't dude (laughs) you can't you can't dan where can people find you Find me on Instagram at Southpaw Instagrammer. Find me at the Whistle Stop every third Friday, at the Cat Club in San Francisco every fourth Friday, giving you the tunes that matter. Yeah, and that means that's this coming Friday at the Whistle Stop in San Diego. So everyone, go say hi to Dan. Scene 
report. Right, we are going to do a Boston area scene report. Uh, I have Renee here from Carrot Cake Fanzine. How is the scene now compared to three to five years ago in uh, your area? Well, in addition to having new faces every year, I'd say that the scene is a bit bigger. Um, there are more shows happening. I think that there's been a big spike after COVID. People seeing what's up maybe online, trying to check it out. Um the scene in Providence recently has become very young. Uh, a lot of teens coming out to shows and a lot of teens starting bands. So there's uh, bands like Catalyst and Bulletproof Backpack, who broke up this year and created the new band Two Boys Kissing. We lost a couple of things like America's Hardcore Fest and some great venues. But I'd say that overall, the scene is going pretty strong in the Boston area right now. Yeah. And just one quick side note. How old are you, Renee? I'm 27. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Because originally, this is our second take, but you, you said that a lot of the kids were half your age. And so I was like... Yeah, I was I was with my friends who are in their early 30s, and they were like, hey, I'm, I'm 32, and these kids are all 15, 16, so... Yeah, I feel you. So what are the main bands right now in the Boston, Providence area? Yeah, so I'd say that probably the biggest, most popular band is Fiddlehead, of course, uh, members of Have Heart and Basement. We've also got some great local acts. Um, C4, Vantage Point, and Burning Lord are all the homies. Uh, just the same guys, just creating awesome music in different bands. We've got uh, bands like Wound Man doing power violence. Uh, we've also got CMI, Haywire, and Risk. It's bands like that just kind of representing um, the skinhead assaults and things like that. Uh, then we've also got kind of Ankle Biter, which turned into a number of other bands like If It Rains, Attrition Ray, and Ultimatum kind of in the Rhode Island area. And then in Western Mass, we've got Restraining Order, of course. They're probably the biggest band out of there right now. Uh, Broken Vow and Connecticut kind of bands like Wreckage, new band called Scud. But that's kind of the main players that we've got going right now. There's a band that just put out a 7-inch called The Massacred. Have you heard of them? The Massacred? Yeah. Anyway, maybe not. It might be a totally different scene. It's called Death March. Anyway, it's like Roots Hardcore. It's so good. But like I talk about it on the pod this week, like they only put two songs up on YouTube right now. It's like, what the fuck is this teaser shit? Just put the record up. You know <laughs> what I mean? So because yeah. you don't you see like the teasers for like the bigger label bands, you know, like, oh, here's a single. Here's another single. But like for yeah. uh I don't know, for a true punk band, like it's kind of weird. Yeah, I'd say that also like within Boston, there is kind of like a weird separation between the hardcore and the like punk, like capital P punk, spiky jacket kind of kids. Like there's a little bit of a separation. We all go to shows at the Middle East, but like it's kind of on different nights. I don't know a lot of the the really punk kind of bands. Well, I do a whole breakdown on the band The Shit Lickers this episode. So check it out. And it's never too late to uh, to buy a to buy a spiky wristband, you know what I'm saying? It's never too late. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so what are the main clubs in uh, the area? And like out-of-town bands, when they're booking their tours and they want to come and play, where should they try to play shows and who should they get in touch with in the area? Yeah, so in Boston, we've got the famous Middle East. They've got the upstairs and downstairs in Central Square. Uh, just a couple blocks from that, we have the Cambridge Elks Lodge, which is lovingly known as the Hardcore Stadium. Uh, shows there have kind of slowed down a little bit, but I really hope that we keep that space. Um, there's also an Elks Lodge in Brighton, which is part of Boston, which is also known as the Tribe Dream Arena. Tribe Dream is dug from C4 and Vantage Point's label. Uh, we've got Deep Cuts, which is like a deli bar, but also venue up in Medford, which is the in like the North Shore area. If you keep going even more north, there's Sammy's Patio, where it's in Revere, and that's where um, Syndrome 81 is playing. So I'm very excited for that. Uh, there's Ralph's Rock Diner in Worcester. And then if we go down into uh, Rhode Island, there's, of course, AS220 in Providence. Uh, Alchemy, where Mind Force is playing soon. Black Lace, which is just like a hole in the wall that I went to uh, the other night. There's the Met in Pawtucket. 
um, Simmons Farm has been putting on shows, which is Brian Simmons from uh, Atomic Action. And also in Western Mass, we've got DIY spaces like Dracula and the Hoff, which are just in like this weird abandoned looking mill building in Holyoke and the Crunch House. So my favorite spots that I think that people should hit, honestly, would be the Brighton Elks, uh, AS220, the Met, if your show is a little bigger, or always hit Western Mass and hit hit like the uh, Dracula or the Hoff. If you want to get in touch with anyone regarding booking, I'd say in Boston, you should get in touch with uh, Doug, who does Tribe Dream Records. You could look up Tribe Dream on Instagram. Uh, in Providence, Nick Bertles from Ankle Biter or Tom Z. Uh, in Western Mass, I'd say hit up Tommy from Anxious and Broken Vow. Any other unique contributors in the area? So obviously we all get Carrot Cake fanzine. It's the shit. Who else Hell is yeah. uh, putting down cool stuff like you are? Well, I am putting down cool stuff and I'm putting down a new issue this summer. So that is going to be super fun. That's almost out. And I will be at the Hardcore Flea Market in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's going to be at Ralph's Rock Diner in the parking lot on August August 31st. The market starts at one and the show is at three. There's some really sick bands on that that you should check out. Very metalcore if you like that kind of shit. Uh, Balmora was on tour, so they can't make it, but it it should be it should be fun. And then I'd say for uh, photographers, we've got the goat Todd Pollock. His Instagram is Eye of the Storm ninety nine, and he has just been around since literally since I've been born. That he's been creating amazing hardcore photography. There's also my friend Pat's Polaroids, who takes of course Polaroids at shows, and they're really cool. And um, he uses expired film, all kinds of different uh, techniques. And then we've got a couple people who uh, are videographers. We've got Montana Media and my friend Jonathan, who does 9-7 Hate. Um, As for record labels, we do have Tribe Dream, like I said. And then there's also uh, No Norms Records, which is a bit more punk. He does a great distro. I got the Illiterates record from him. Hell yeah. Uh, what are the best vegan and vegetarian spots in Boston right now? You know that I'm the best person to ask for this as the resident <laughs> uh, Boston Providence vegan. There are many of us, though. I will be honest. Okay. So in uh, Providence, I will say that the best spot to go now, if you're in a touring band, is the Providence Vegan Deli. It's a brand new spot on Hope Street in Providence, and touring bands get to eat free. If you have proof that you are in a band and you are playing Providence or you're stopping by just going through up 190, going through up 95, I'd say stop by the vegan deli. He makes his own seitan in house and it's so fire. Uh, there's also Garden Grill and Wildflower in Pawtucket, uh, Pianta and Plant City in Providence, but in Boston. There is um, Veggie Galaxy, which is right around the corner from the Middle East. Taco Party in Medford. It's not in Medford. Taco Party in Somerville. And, of course, Pressed Cafe has a ton of vegan options. Hell yeah. How about record stores? What's the best spot to go if you want punk and hardcore? If you want punk and hardcore, I would stop by my favorite store, which is called Wanna Hear It in Watertown. Uh, It's run by Joey Cahill, who does... 6131 Records, and he has an awesome, wonderfully curated store. I've gotten some really cool rare shit from him, but there's also um, Armageddon in Providence and in Boston, which is punk, metal, hardcore, anything like that that you might want. We're fans of Joey. We go way back. So what's up, Joey? What's going on? Hell yeah. Shout out Joey. He's got a great store. That's right. And shout out Sam, who works there. (laughs) <laughs> that's right both of them and dfj who works there hey shout out to the whole crew what's going on <laughs> okay uh where do hardcore kids hang out in the uh in the area if there's no shows going on where are you guys hanging at the new spot is the providence vegan deli can't tell you how many times i've seen the guys from peace test posting that they're there um also i want to hear it and when there are shows you can definitely catch people hanging out at veggie galaxy and the mcdonald's in central square 
And how should people find out about shows? Is there any sort of listing? Yeah, certainly. So my friend Gabe does a website and an Instagram that is all Boston area shows. Uh, His website is safeinacrowd.com. The Instagram is safe.in.a.crowd. <laughs> and if, if you want to uh, see Providence shows, there is the at Providence Hardcore page. And Western Mass has at WMassHC shows. All right, Renee, it's time to put on your wizard hat. Where Ooh. do you see the scene? Where do you see the scene in three to five years from now? I see the scene still thriving but maybe slightly smaller. I think that the post COVID boom might be over soon. I don't know because it just keeps on fucking raging. Uh, I see a lot of younger kids wanting to start bands and actually getting out there and starting. Uh, So I see a new generation beginning and I'm kind of hoping to see a little bit more of the regular hardcore. I want the, the demo core revival that we all, have been wanting since the demo core day of America's hardcore at the final fest. So I'm hoping to see a little bit more regular, a uh, ton of mosh. Uh, I want to see more people coming out to shows too, but I think that, you know, we just want the real ones to kind of stick around. Yeah. Okay. Where can everyone find you and uh, follow you? Yeah. So you can follow me at carrot cake, 1996 on Instagram. And I also have a website where I sell my art and my zines. So keep an eye out for that. That is carrotcakezine.com. And I have commissioned you for some sick-ass burrito art. So uh, I appreciate that. Yes, of course. If you want to commission me, just send me a DM or email me at carrotcakezine at gmail.com. And I will be happy to work with you. Oh, yeah. Renee, thanks so much for your time. Yes, thank you, Zach. Right, this week on the pod, I got Beto from Demise, Asphyxiation, 25 to Life from Marauder and Madball. What's up, dude? What's up, Zach? How's it going, man? What is going on? Okay, everyone, before we get started, I just want to say for a longer interview with Beto, uh, where he talks a lot more about his origin story and all that, check out uh, episode 121 of the This Is Hardcore podcast. Joe dove real deep with him, and I think you guys went like two and a half hours. It was sick. Yeah, I'm, I didn't. Yeah, it was pretty long. I was like, man, I don't know if I've got that much history, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then if you got time, you can also go to the episode fifty four of This Is Hardcore and get with your boy, me. So uh, check that one out too, everyone. Oh, I'll check that uh, out. Hell yeah! Okay, um, Beto Demise records two demos in nineteen ninety with Don Fury. What was your uh, your first impression of Don Fury, and then what were your memories of recording those two demos? The um, well, I, I was I was stoked to be going to Don because he had a lot of history already, you know, working with AF and all the other bands, you know, Judge and so many bands that he's worked with over there. So to me, it was an honor to just even get down there. But, you know, what we used to do was originally we would go to Don's and we would do two track live demos. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a lot of those. And, you know, eventually we saved up enough to uh, to do that eight track demo, the first one, which I think might have been 89, actually, when we did that. And um, to me, you know, I, I remember not knowing what the hell I was doing. I don't think we were that that prepared for uh, <laughs> for recording those songs. They were kind of like written really quick, but um, it, it didn't matter. I think it captured the essence of how we were. You know, we were young. We were playing our instruments for like maybe a year tops at the time. And uh, and Don made us sound better than we actually really sounded back then, because, like I said, we really didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know how to get a sound. Um, we were just, you know, I'd come up with a riff or Hoy would come up with a riff. Our drummer would throw the drums on, the, you know, whatever beat he wanted to throw on there. And uh, and we would let Jeer on the first demo basically say whatever the hell he wanted. You know, we were kids. Um it, it exceeded my expectations. I'll say that. And, and Don was an awesome dude to, uh, to start the journey with. 
Yeah. What was he like as a person? Like when you're dealing with him as like a young dude that doesn't really know too much of what you're doing. Actually, I felt bad for him because <laughs> I felt like I was asking, you know, I felt like I was asking maybe things that I didn't know much about. So I'd be like, Hey Don, let's do this. Or, Hey, you know, I want to get this heavier sound and, and, you know, things that really were more up to me than that than were up to him. And, you know, he would kind of he would work with us. But I I could tell that, you know, sometimes it was probably frustrating him. Um, but I was maybe what, like 16 years old using like two distortion pedals at a time. No, no noise gate, you know, just creating chaos. Um, but like I said, you know, he did good. You know, he added, you know, I, I could hear he added like reverb, which to the guitar tracks, which back then I guess was kind of big. I noticed like even the metal bands were doing it stuff that, that I didn't ask him to do, but he, he knew what was up. He knew what to do to uh, help us sound as, as good as we wanted to sound. And we didn't, you know, we did two demos with him. By the time we did the second demo, I had more of an idea of what I was doing and the other guys too. And, and we had uh cheeky singing on that one. And you, you could tell the difference between, that first demo and the second demo, the second one starts with From Reality. And you could tell, you know, we we started, you know, becoming a real band and um, and and we gelled a lot better. You know, it, the, the song sounded better, well put. Um, the the recording was better quality. And that wasn't Don's, you know, Don Fury's fault. That was that was us because we actually started learning how to uh tune our instruments maybe and how to get a real sound, you know, where before, like, like I said, I, all I did was I bought like a boss heavy metal pedal and like an overdrive. And I plugged it into like a little combo Marshall that Don had in there. And I just turned everything to like 10 because that's all I knew how to do back then. Yeah. And the first one you're, is, is kind of all over the place in a way of like, it has like fast beats on it, but they kind of get backwards sometimes. Like it's kind of a little more old school sounding. And then, on the second demo, you're kind of coming into your own sound. Like you have more of a direction of what you're going for. Yeah. Yeah. Because on, on the first demo, you know, like Richie, you know, our, our, our drummer, he didn't know much. Uh, he knew as much as I knew about writing music. And you're right. You know, I've heard that before that some of the beats sound like they're kind of like backwards. And, you know, there's mistakes on the guitars that I left on there and, and you know, notes that pop in and then pop right back out that shouldn't be there. But, you know, for that second demo, we were practicing a lot more. Um, we were we were a lot more confident with what we were doing. You know, we were older, and and uh, you know you could you could hear it there. And you know, by the time we did the third demo, you know, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but then you know you could hear that the musicianship got a lot better. Yeah, that backwards fast beat. Like I, I wonder about that sometimes because like there was a lot of. Not a lot, but there was a handful of hardcore bands that came out of like NorCal in like the mid late nineties, and they all did that backwards fast beat. Like you uh, kind of wonder, we screwed you know? them up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, well, you wonder, right? Like maybe the demo like circulated, and like that's what they heard, and that was like easier to do the snare on the one than on the two. Like who knows? Yeah, it's really bizarre. But you know what? I mean, that's cool. You know, I mean, sometimes cool things come out of mistakes. You know, and. Uh, I know like Richie was like a huge Dave Lombardo fan. Um, I don't know if he translated something Dave Lombardo was doing into that type of fast beat. I mean, who knows? But um, or you know what? He lives out in, in Southern California now. Maybe he's out there secretly teaching these guys how to play that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the first two verses on Silent Scream on that Slayer song, uh, they are that backwards fast beat. And then he breaks into the regular fast beat on the third verse. So maybe, that could, you know, yeah, that could be it. He was all Lombardo, man, like completely like that's all he did was uh, worship Dave Lombardo. And, you know, um, sometimes you know, sometimes it was crazy because, you know, that that meant that meant doing more than what was than what was necessary for the song. Sometimes and sometimes I just watch him be like, Richie, that's crazy. <laughs> you don't need to go that nuts. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think it gave us a cool you know, a cool sound. We, we were trying to be metal before we knew how to play metal. You know what I mean? So you're around age 16, New York city, 1990. What is like the scene? Like, where are you going to shows at? How many kids are showing up at hardcore shows? Like, can you kind of paint the picture? It was, uh, geez, you know, I, I want to say we started going to shows at 80 in 86. We were like 13 years old. I want to say, 
And uh, the shows back then were packed. Every CB's matinee that I remember was packed, no matter what. Every Sunday when I went, it didn't matter who was playing, the show was packed. The line would go all the way down the block and it would wrap around. Um, a lot of times the shows were so packed that that half the crowd was outside. You know, the walls were like sweaty, dripping in there because there's so many people in there. Um I remember we'd get violent at times, but, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it really didn't matter. It was, uh, um, it would turn out being a good show anyway. We, we used to go to CBs a lot. I remember going to the Pyramid a lot. Shows at the Pyramid were hit or miss. Some of them would pack in, some of them wouldn't, but it, it didn't seem like as many people would go there as, as CBs maybe. But um, those were the main spots that that I would go to for shows back then. And then, you know, you had like Lemoore's out in Brooklyn, but that was, uh, you know, that that was, you know, there was a lot of hardcore, play, hardcore bands playing there, but it was mainly the metal scene that was going over there, which was cool. And then, you know, that ended up introducing metal into into the 90s hardcore bands like, you know, like Us and Marauder, Confusion, you know, um, going to shows in Brooklyn there at, at Lemoore's basically exposed us to to the more metallic side of the music, you know. Yeah, but CBs was kind of like off again, on again in the late 80s, early 90s, right? Like it, it stopped doing hardcore shows in 89 for a while, and then it starts back up in the early 90s and then stops again. Do you remember all it, that? It did, yeah. And I remember, and that was because of the violence, you know, would, Hilly, would, Hilly would get fed up and then he would, you know, he would stop the hardcore shows. And, I, you know, I, being older now, I understand when I was a kid, I just get mad and start cursing about it. But um, he needed hardcore to keep that place running. So, so, you know, he would shut it down and then he would bring it back because he needed us. And, uh, you know, that's what basically brought about the wetlands, you know, when CB stopped having shows, the wetlands started having shows and the shows at the wetlands were crazy. They were packed. They were insane. Um, they were fun. Uh, you know, that, that's one spot that I really miss. I think that for the, for the nineties era of hardcore was, you know, probably, more important than CBs, I would say. And what was the proximity of that to CBs? Not far, not far. Okay. I'd say, you know, what, like 15 minutes. Okay, right on. Um, so Demise does a third demo in 1992. How has like the hardcore scene in New York City changed between the first and the third demo, like that two-year stretch? It was, uh, you know... I want to say that if I remember correctly, the scene started declining. Things started, you know, the show started getting smaller for a little bit. It was really weird because I, I remember, you know, we, we did that demo over, which we actually recorded in New Jersey, in Jackson, New Jersey at Wildfire. Um, so it was a different studio. It wasn't with Dawn. And uh, that place came recommended by, I believe it was Mike Dijon because his old band Show of Force recorded over there. But um, the scene itself, I noticed, was kind of dying out. Um, the shows weren't as packed anymore. And, and that I want to say that 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 post hardcore era started coming in like, you know, quicksand and all those type of bands. And it seemed like those were those were the bands that were becoming popular. And, uh, you know, the, the heavier kind of more, you know, crazier bands, I guess you'd say, like us weren't, uh, you know, I, I guess we, we just weren't doing as well for a while. And I remember doing a few shows with with AF even for that. I want to say it was around right before they broke up. And even those shows weren't all that, you know, it was weird. And hardcore kind of died out. And I want to say it came back around 94. It's weird. I, I wonder if there's some parallels to now, because it seems like, you know, you have those giant shows like the in effect show and I'm sure there had to be other big shows like that, but then like, yeah, like the, the underground shit it kind of starts slipping where you still have like these giant peaks, but like the valleys keep getting deeper and deeper, you know, do you, was that like a thing at all? Or do you think it like just everything declined like, like sharply from like 91 to 92? I think everything kind of declined sharply except for that post hardcore era. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and I'm not just saying this because these are my friends that I grew up with, but I remember when when Demise, while I was in Demise towards the end, I was also in Asphyxiation and, and, and Hoya was already playing in Madball. And um, 
I remember the Hall court scene kind of dying and, you know, we decided, you know what, you know, uh, he'll, he'll go on doing mad ball and I'll go on doing asphyxiation. And for that little moment in time when I was doing asphyxiation, it looked like the metal scene was getting a lot bigger than the hardcore scene, which, which, you know, and this, I'm talking about like the local metal scene, not, not the big metal scene. And, um, and 94, when, when, when mad ball came out was set it off, the scene just exploded all over again. It was weird. It seemed like overnight it exploded and it ushered in like a whole new batch of bands that were kind of like in the same vein. And it just kept going up, up and up from there. But, you know, I want to say maybe from like, I don't know, 91 or 92 to 94 was kind of dead. You know, 94 things started coming, coming right back. And, and I'll, I'll, you know, I think that we got Madball to thank for that. Yeah. Also, you have a uh, sick of it all scratch the surface is 94. Right. So like that's a big record as well. But it is strange because, you know, just look around is 92. Agnostic Front One Voice is 92. Both like total classic hardcore records and and yeah just a rough year huh they are yeah but i don't think one voice was well received i love one voice i think it's one of the best af records i mean i, For I sure. think it's freaking great but when it came out it wasn't well received um scratch the surface was scratch the surface absolutely was well received but sick of it all was one of those bands that at that time they were so big it didn't matter if the scene was dying in new york they were still doing well Right. You know, yeah, they, they uh, transcended kind of at that point. Yeah, they, they did. Where, you know, if hardcore shows were dead at the time, let's say at, at like at like the wetlands, it didn't matter. Sick of it all would go in there and sell it out. Um, you know, so they uh, they they got to that level. Well, I don't think they felt what was going on in New York the way that we all felt. Um, but, you know, like I said, it, starting with 94 with, with Madball and, you know, set it off. And I want to say... Uh, you know, Life of Agony came out with what River Runs Red. Everything started getting huge again, all over again. Um, it was awesome. Yeah, it was it was a great time. I, I, and you know, the odd thing is, I want to say like you know, Roadrunner. I guess Roadrunner, you know, had a hand in, in the signing these bands that kind of brought the scene back to life. And and you know, I always considered that a metal label, but but it definitely helped us out. I want to get your impression on set it off, but before we go there, what, like who are these kids you think like that go see sick of it all, but then don't go see the other hardcore bands. Like who are these people, man? I don't want to offend anybody by saying it. It's, but it's like, <laughs> you know, listen, the, the people that would go to those shows, I don't, th- I think were people that wanted to go to a show that they felt safe at. And I I think a lot of people felt safe at these sick of it all shows and they didn't feel safe at like, let's say like a mad ball show. So I want to say that, that of the crowd, maybe like the crowds that would go to like these straight edge shows, you know, those younger kids, I think that they felt safe going to like a sick of it all show, but they didn't feel safe going to like Marauder, mad ball, things like that. So, you know, I think that that crowd helped help sick of it all. Uh, transcend what was going on, you know, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. I mean, it's great that, that, that they appeal to, you know, a, a, a larger audience, but part of that audience wasn't available to us. And I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, the, with the way the scene was, you know, the violence and all that stuff. And I, I guess, you know, I can't blame people. Um, you didn't really see much of that happening at sick of it all shows. So I think that's something that, that, on top of them being great, you know, help them out that they kind of uh, seem separate from what was going on in the New York scene at the time. Do you think their connection to that scene was just solely because they put out that EP on Rev? And so that kind of like it had a long tail and all the same kids kind of liked it, like their whole catalog? It could be. It's weird. I mean, you know, I I have a hard time understanding it. Sometimes I think that things are meant to be and they happen the way they're supposed to happen. I mean, I was always a big sick of it all fan from the beginning, from the demo. Right. And um, when, when that, when that seven inch came out um, on Rev, I really didn't think, I mean, Revelation to me was just a hardcore label. Um, they were putting out a lot of bands back then. So I don't think that they were as exclusive to that crowd back then as they are sort of now, you know what I mean? I think revelation was more of just a hardcore label. Uh, later on, I think it became something else. Um, 
where you know only certain certain genres of hardcore would, would you know would come out on that label. But um, you know, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it has to do with you really honestly didn't see the violence happening at the Sick of It All shows the way you saw it at the other shows for whatever reason, you know, and, um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff too with, you know, the, the crew affiliations back in the day in the nineties, you know, that, that, that probably, you know, had some play in it where, you know, I mean, I didn't see it because you know, I grew up in the city, but I would say that if I was like a suburban kid and, uh, I'm going to go to like a show where, where I would think that, you know, there's going to be fights and I'll be like, oh, there's going to be some crews over there. Maybe I'm going to stay home. You know what I mean? Where uh, for, for us living in the boroughs, it was like normal. Like we didn't care. I mean, if anything, we we kind of like the danger part of the shows in a weird way. Not that I wanted something bad to happen, but it added to the excitement in a weird way, you know? Yeah. You, you grew up with Hoya. So like, did you get to hear Set It Off before it came out? Yeah, absolutely. What were your impressions like the first time you heard it? Like, did you think it was going to be the game changer that it was? I did. And I told him that because, you know, the reason why I did was because, like I told you before, like, I, you know, I was playing in asphyxiation. That was my main thing at the time. And um, I wasn't listening to much hardcore um, after Demise, mainly because, you know, you started having like a lot of cool records coming out from, from like metal bands. Like, you know, like I said on the Joe's podcast, like Heartwork from Carcass, you know, uh, Cause of Death, Obituary, you know, a few death records, Spiritual Healing. And I was like, you know what, let me just give Hardcore a break. And I, I just wasn't really impressed by what was coming out from Hardcore bands at the time. And um, when I heard Set It Off, it immediately, it, it immediately grabbed me. And I remember telling Hoy, I was like, dude, I don't know what you guys did but this is going to blow up. I'm like, it's just, it sounded and felt very New York, you know, um, it grooved and they didn't, they didn't overdo it. It was just very natural. It, it didn't seem like they were trying to be something that they weren't it, the, the way they looked and the way they sounded was perfect, you know? And, uh, and I think it changed, I think it changed the game and I knew it. I mean, I had the, I had the promo copy of it. I wore that freaking thing out on cassette and, uh, in the CDs as well. And, you know, it stood the test of time. I mean, to the, to this day, those guys are still playing those songs from that first record, probably more than any of the other records they ever released, you know? Yeah. It's their victim in pain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's definitely their victim in pain. Um, yeah. They killed it with that one. But what, what were your impressions of 25 to life before you joined the band? Oh, before I, before I joined 25 to life, I heard the band through, uh, my friend Frankie, that was living with Hoya. Um, when I first heard the band, I thought it was cool, but um, it didn't immediately grab me to be completely honest, just because, you know, I, I having had already played in Demise and then playing in Asphyxiation, I was kind of like, a, I was more on the, I, I want to say on that death metal thing going, <laughs> you know, but um, I remember them asking me, they were uh, they were getting ready to relieve their other guitarist, um, Steve Pettit. And Steve Pettit was my rhythm guitarist in Asphyxiation. So um, they asked me if I wanted to play. And, you know, I, I really didn't want to replace Steve because he was my buddy. And they told me they were going to get rid of him anyway, you know, for whatever reason that I don't I don't remember exactly what happened. Maybe those guys weren't seen eye to eye about something. But uh, I ended up joining and, and, you know, the main thing that I wanted to do was, which, which is the reason why you hear all that crazy whammy bar stuff. I kind of like wanted to add what a few of the things that I was doing in asphyxiation to 25 to life, um, make it not sound as bland, you know, because that was the only thing like I felt like it, it was cool, but it sounded a little bland. And um, I, I guess I try to like make it a little crazy with white, my whammy stuff. Maybe I went a little too crazy with it. <laughs> no, I mean the squealing stuff on keeping it real makes the record, you know, like it, it's wild. Like that sound you get, it almost, it, awesome. it just sounds almost like you're just getting feedback for like a split second, like right in front of your amp. I can't really tell what it is. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're flutters, you know, they're, they're like, I guess long flutters or cat purrs with the Floyd Rose. And, you know, I used to write a lot of solos with them, but with 25 to life, like those, those uh, like melodic solos, I don't think really would have worked for that band. Like the solos I would write in Demise would just, it, it wasn't for 25 to life. 
So instead of adding something that was going to add melody, I was like, you know what, let me just add something that's going to make it maybe a little more chaotic or meaner, you know, and, and then after a while it was just dive bombs and, 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 and flutters. And it's funny because like, you know, I, I practice a lot with those guys now and I'm back to doing that same stuff and, and it feels very natural. <laughs> it's not even like I had to relearn it. You know, it just automatically comes out. It's like I kind of just made it my style, you know? Yeah, it's great because it sounds like it's an alarm going off right before a tempo change. Yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, I could imagine with, if somebody's never heard it before and one of those things hit like on uh, on short fuse, it probably make you bug out and be like, what the hell is that? You know, uh. freaking... Is that like a, something went wrong there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a few comp songs that come out in 95 that predate Keeping It Real. Are these the first recordings that you do with 25 to Life? Yes. Yeah, the first thing I did was uh, – what was that that comp? Is that New York's Hardest, I want to say? Yeah, so so there's New York's Hardest comp. That's Keeping It Real and Reality's End come out on that. And then there's also another comp, Psycho Civilized comp. Inside Knowledge is on there. I don't, I don't know if that's a different recording of it or if it's uh, the same one from the self-titled. Interesting. I don't think I was on that one. Maybe that they might have just taken, unless it's a live version, because I never re-recorded Inside Knowledge. So that, that might have been a recording from Steve Pettit's era. But the, the first thing that I did, the first recording that I did with that band was uh, Reality's End and, and, uh, and Keeping It Real for uh, New York's Hardest. And, and I wrote a solo that's more like... Uh, like a demise type solo for reality's end. Yeah. What do you remember about that recording session? Oh, it was funny, man. I remember coming in and, and, you know, Tim who owned the studio, he owned big blue Mini, you know, God rest his soul. Good guy. I remember going to the studio. He had a problem with something that I was doing. I don't remember what the hell it was, but, um, I forget what he what he wanted me to do, but I remember we ended up kind of like not seeing eye to eye. I ended up doing my tracks and years later, and I mean, I'm jumping years later, you know, when I when I was in Madball and I did hold it down again, I'm back at his studio and he ends up saying, you know, talking to me about it. He's like, hey, he's like, hey, Beto, let's let that go. Water under the bridge. Right. And I was like, oh, dude, I, was like, I completely <laughs> forgot about that. I, don't even know. <laughs> I was like, I can't even believe you remembered, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Did, yeah, did but, you write, did you, or oh, I should ask, who wrote the chorus, uh, uh, who wrote the chorus riff for Keeping It Real? I believe the chorus riff was written by Fred. Most of Keeping It Real is written by Fred, except for the lyrics. And, uh, and Reality's End was written by, by uh, Frankie, that was the original bass player before Warren. Those two songs were written before I was in the band. How do you feel the first time you hear like that chorus riff of Keeping It Real? The dun 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 dun. Like it's it's the ultimate riff, right? It's so simple and so good, and it's just one of those things. Like, why didn't I think of it? You know? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I yeah, I love it. It's um, Fred is really good at writing dance riffs, mainly because you know I think he's one of those dudes that would always dance. He was one of the guys at CBs that always be dancing. I wasn't never really a big dancer. You know, so I, I think sometimes you got to be in it to win it. You know, he knows what he wants to dance to. So he writes it, you know, and, uh, and and it shows, you know, it shows in that riff. Like a lot of bands today are playing that riff tuned down like A or B. And it sounds like something completely different, but it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, I think definitely it's, it started a type of style, you know. So you saw what was going on with 25 to life, like, you know, 93, 94. Do you, do you see a boost in popularity? Like after that comp comes out and like, you guys have like a certified hit. Yes. Yeah. Because by the time, well, you know, we, we used to play a lot of shows. I mean, a lot of shows. I felt like we were playing minimum three shows a week. Um, sometimes four to five shows a week. And that wasn't even being on tour. That was like just leaving my house after work and we'd be driving out to play shows all over the area. But, uh, you know, by the time that, by the time we started doing real touring, which wasn't until what, 96, when that Keeping It Real uh, EP came out, that was, um, 
I mean, the first, the European tour was packed. Every show was packed. We were all, we, our first tour was in a bus, you know, and we were headlining. So I was surprised. I, I expected, I didn't expect for the shows to be as good as they were. And I, you know, to be completely honest, I don't remember playing really any empty whack shows, even in the States, you know, um, whether we were out in the West Coast or we were out in the East Coast or, or, or Europe, even when, you know, we do Japan, the shows were always packed. So we were blessed, you know. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, that's all I, I that's I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. We were definitely blessed because other bands that I've been in, you, we, I, I felt like we had to work harder than 25 to Life had to. The New York hardcore documentary was recorded in 95. Uh, the 25 to Life show that was filmed was on July 27th at the Pipeline in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, yes. What were your memory? What were your memories of that show and like the filming? My memories of that show. Well, more than likely it was a Thursday. I remember that. I remember. Uh, <laughs> I remember <laughs> Hoy and Nark. Uh, Hoy and Nark came with me that day. I. Uh, what else do I remember? I remember I forgot my distortion pedals. Okay. So I got this real dry ass guitar sound on that documentary because I forgot my damn pedals. <laughs> <laughs> um, geez, besides that, you, you know, it was a fun time. I think for some reason I want to say VOD was playing. I mean, I know Tim was over there cause I I've seen him in the video. Yeah, they played. Um, it just, you know, that was one of those spots where, where, we would hit it all the time and the shows were always on Thursday nights. I still lived in, in Queens and I would, I would freaking get picked up by Warren right after work, head all the way down there, play that, you know, play the show over there. Like it was crazy. I don't know how the hell we did it. You know, we'd be doing it on like minimal sleep, you know, get up at six in the morning and I'm hitting the stage at like 10 30 at night, you know, and, and probably drunk off my ass too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, what else was I going to do when I was a kid? I was, you know, we were, what, we were all like a mess. Was the recording raw though, or was there any like bullshit going on? Like, for instance, when they did like that third decline of the Western civilization, like documentary out here in LA or out in LA, they like the rumor is like they moved everyone up that looked punk. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you're a square, like get in the back. We want all the, the true punks up front. You know what I mean? Like, was there any crowd coaching or anything weird like that for the documentary, or was it all just like legit shot? No, it was legit. Yeah, Frank didn't do any of that. He basically just came in there with the cameras and whatever always goes on is is exactly what he caught there. And, um, you know, most of the shows were even crazier than that one, to be honest. I mean, when I watch the footage of it now, I'm like, oh, it was a good show, but it wasn't as packed as some of the other shows that we play there. Um, but that was... Um, <clears throat> That no, there was no coaching there, and what's funny is a lot of the people you've seen those videos still go to shows today. You know, it's yeah. it's pretty bugged out to me. Like the the Jersey the Jersey scene because that you know that club was in Newark stayed pretty consistent. And uh, like I said, a lot of those people that you've seen those videos still go to shows today um, if they still live in the area. But um, you know, I I remember you know Virginia was on the documentary. You know, she she passed away, but she was at every show, no matter what. It did not matter. She was there. She was going to make it somehow. Um, and that that was cool that that was captured because she she definitely deserved the place in that video because she was uh, like I said at everybody's show, not just Twenty Five to Life. That that was pretty impressive. You know, I think about it now. I'm like, like, geez, that was her life. <laughs> You know, it was all for all of us, but she wasn't in a band. You know what I mean? So that was impressive. No, she was great on that. That's good that they interviewed like a true fan like that. Were Were you interviewed at all, and they just cut your clip? No, I wasn't interviewed at all. You know, for for that they interviewed. It looks like they just interviewed mainly front men. I mean, I know Dijon got interviewed for that, but uh, they interviewed Rick. You know, they went to his place, um, Freddie, Isaac, but. You know, it could have also been because I had I had a day job back then. I wasn't as available as those other guys were. So, you know, um, for to, to get me would have been pretty tough for sure. Yeah. They did interview Caesar in like maybe the best scene in the documentary, right? Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. 
And I'm sure he regrets it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> we love it though. I mean, what a what an American hero, right? Like that. Yeah, that Caesar's funny freaking movie. funny as hell, man. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know. When I watch it sometimes, I, when I watch it sometimes, I'm like, man, I'm like, that is, that's like the most awesome part of the whole documentary. But I'm like, I wonder how he feels about it now. It's so cool. Cause like, it's that. And then they like cut to him, like busting, like the gnarliest solo, like outside at some gig. Oh yes. Yeah. I remember that. It's yeah. So he was sick. good, man. He was, he was good rocking that Les Paul, man. He was younger than all of us. And he was, you know, he, he would go off, man. He was impressive to watch Caesar. And uh, yeah. it was almost like he would just zone out into his own place when he was playing. That's so sick. What were your thoughts on the documentary when it came out? Cause it came out like significantly later, like four years later. Yeah, it did. I, you know, by the time it came out, I forgot we did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember Frank, Frank sent us copies and I, I was happy with it, man. I was happy when, when it came out, I thought it captured us, it, you know, I, the way we really were like, I, you know, I don't think that, that we were presented in the wrong light. Um, I think Frank did an awesome job and uh, I think he caught the scene at a perfect time, you know, when it was, it was really growing again. And uh, you know, the funny thing is years later out of, out of the blue, he hit me up and he sent me DVD copies of it, like a deluxe edition with like additional interviews. I loaned it to somebody and I don't know where the hell it went. It's freaking gone. It's not in my house anymore. I wish I still had it. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to have to hit him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. It came out later. Like, I think it was like a 10 year anniversary or something, and it had all new interviews. It was sick. Yes. Yeah, you got it. But no, I was, uh, to, to this day, I still have the, the, the VHS version. I think my son watches it sometimes. Um, yeah, but it was so cool, man. I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad that he caught it, you know, and I'm glad that he let us just do our thing and he showed us for who we really were, you know? Yeah, such a great time capsule. Um, okay, so 96, 25 to Life puts out, Probably its best record, uh, six song, keeping it real CD. You recorded it in Result Studio. Um, what are your memories of that session? Um, I I remember that you, you know the the main thing was we were trying to make it. You know, everybody hearing like you know everybody coming out with these great records, like you know Mad Ball coming out with Set It Off, and you know you hear Life of Agony, like I said, River Runs Red, all these other bands. I wanted to make sure that it came out as as good or, or as awesome sounding as it possibly could. So I remember going in there with high expectations. And uh, and I think that when I got the mixed copy of that recording, I was happy with it. But when we mastered it, I dropped it off at Frankfurt Wayne for mastering. It was one of those deals that you just drop it in a mailbox and then you pick it up a few days later. And I wasn't happy with the mastered version. I felt like like they neutered the recording. <laughs> and I was like, shit, man. I'm like, all that work for nothing. But, you know, we even had AJ from Leeway come in and help us out during the mix. Um, and like I said, it sounded really good, man. But I really don't know what happened during the mastering. They just, maybe they overly compressed the whole thing. Um, I wish that everybody would have heard it the way it was before it was mastered, you know, to be completely honest. But uh, it was a fun time being in the studio. Like, I, you know, Harry, the drummer I've known forever, you know, um, same thing with Fred, you know, uh, Warren and, you know, and Rick, I, Rick, I met when I was in Demise. So it was it was definitely a cool experience to be in there recording those songs for those guys. And some of those songs were already recorded. Like, I know they recorded uh, Short Fuse and maybe Keeping It Real before on the 7 Inch. So, you know, re- redoing that for the uh, for the Keeping It Real CD was pretty cool better sound quality you know it, it's it's the best sounding record straight straight through unity sounds great too but like keeping it real it's so monotone in the best ways I, i'm surprised you don't like how it sounds you still feel that way that like it doesn't sound good i i just you know if i never heard it before the mastering i'd yeah. be okay with it but but it was it sounded more raw before it was mastered. Um, it, the best way for me to explain it to you is after they mastered it, it almost sounded like they put a pillow on the speaker. You know, yeah, it's, but it's still so bright, right? Like I, I get it. it. I can, I can, I can take your your idea of it being super compressed, but like it's compressed and then mastered. Like it's it's gnarly sounding, dude. I don't know. Like for that type of music, I think it's one of the greatest recordings there is. Just in the way awesome, that it's like right? it's it's just so monotone. 
right? But you hear everything, and it's so like big. I don't know. Oh, thank you. Know, yeah, man. Maybe I'm being a little bit too hard on it, but that you know that was that was only because because when I picked it up from Frankfurt Wayne, I was like, what did they do? And I'm like, there's nobody for me to speak to. And you just pick it up. I'm like. Like, I was like, I need to talk to somebody. I was like, what happened to the recording, you know? No, no. I but, mean, like, I think a record like One Voice, like that could be remastered, right? Like it, the mix is great. The songs are great. It's my second favorite AF record. But like, well, here's the thing with that record. That could be the same thing. That was also mastered at Frankfurt Wayne. <laughs> That's some shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. They may be the culprits, man. <laughs> what the fuck is going on around here? Yeah, oh, they man. they neutered both of us, man. It, but yeah, it, that that yeah, you're right. One voice could definitely benefit from a remaster. That you know, um, but that record is so damn good, man. So good. So yeah, good. It, it was yeah. I couldn't believe it when I heard like when I saw it hearing the bad reviews. I'm like, these people don't know what the hell they're talking about. I'm like, these guys just did their most most professional record of their career, yeah. and people are actually talking smack. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with them? You know, that's insane. Yeah, so. 25 to life came to the West coast after that record then, huh? I, I just must've missed you. I got into hardcore in like 96 and I don't, I didn't get to see 25 to life until strength to, until the strength through unity tour. So oh, what okay. do you, what do you remember about coming to the West coast? Like off the keeping a real record. Do you fly yeah, out and you drive was, out? What do you do? You really just missed us because that was 97 when we went out there. What the and, fuck? Uh, yeah, dude, you, you just missed us. But we, we flew out there, and I, I want to say most of the tour was booked by, by the Powerhouse guys. Yeah, um, we went to all their shows. So we Yeah. Were- yeah, and so yeah, you really just missed us, man. But it was it was a good time. Um great shows. Uh I also remember almost getting killed out okay. there. But uh Let's start with that. the good though. Let's start with the good. So do, yeah, you, yeah. do you remember do you remember at all where you played in Southern California? Man, I can't I can't exactly remember the names of the places. Yeah. I yeah, wish yeah. I did. But I mean okay. I could tell you we played at San Diego, we played Sacramento, um, huh. we played Oakland. Okay. Uh, I want to say Fresno as well. Okay. You know, we, we were all over the place, but I don't remember exactly the names of these places. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the uh yeah, the sh- those guys made sure that the shows were were amazing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we played Gilman Street. That might have been one of the places. I think. Yeah, that's sick. So, so you almost got killed. You, I think you told the story on Joe's podcast. Well, let's get it here for my people. Ah, uh, so yeah. This, so this, it, this it, led it, you wanting to leave the band, right? What's that? This is part of what led to you wanting to leave the band. Yeah, yeah, part of it. I mean, you know, it, it was pretty stupid. I mean, basically. I, you know, I had, well, listen, I I can't say I didn't know about the colors thing in in California because I had seen the movie Colors, as corny as that sounds, (laughs) you know, but but I didn't think that it was really like that big of a deal over there. So, you know, we're out in the Mission District and I'm wearing all blue, you know, Um, and uh, I leave a convenience store. I'm outside, you know, drinking my Snapple and... uh, I see some kid dressed in all red. I didn't really think about it. And, you know, he basically, he asked me, he goes, Hey man, are you a scrap? And I'm like, what the hell is a scrap? And he asked me again and, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, what the hell is this guy saying? And I'm like, I'm like, bro, I said, uh, I'm from New York. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And he, and he whistles and then he, he yells to his boys, yo, New York city scrap. And I'm like, Holy shit, that can't be good. And all of a sudden I see like, Tons of guys coming from every corner at the, this intersection. I see guys coming with machetes. I see guys coming with broken crutches. I see guys coming with bats, knives, you name it. You know, Rick, Rick is in a record store. I don't know what he was doing. I think buying, buying you know, uh, CDs so that he could sell and shirts or something like that. And uh, we all run in there. We tell him, like, listen, dude, we got to get out. We got a problem. This is going to get bad. And he didn't want to leave. And I'm like, look, look outside. <laughs> he looks outside. And he's like, what the fuck did you do? And I was like, bro, let's worry about that later. I was like, because this is serious shit, you know. And it got to the point that they were like surrounding the record store. And I remember that a, that a, a squad car 
popped up. And while that squad car was there, we all ran into our cars and broke out. Otherwise, I mean, who knows what would have happened? Because, right. you know, as far as those guys were concerned, we, we were we were Crips or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. So there was no there was going to be no mercy there. They would have asked questions after or maybe not even asking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's wild. So you leave 25 to life. It, again, everyone check out the Joe Hardcore. They get into all the details. But uh, you joined Marauder. What what was it like? Jo- like playing with Marauder, like circa '97. Um, it was it was cool, man. I uh, you know when 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 I left Twenty Five to Life, I wasn't sure if I was even going to continue doing music. Like I, I figured I was going to take a little break. Um, a few things ran to my head. I was uh, I think at the time. At the time, I was thinking of going to try out for Machine Head. I was like, maybe I'll go do that and move out to Cali because I liked Cali so much. Um, but uh, what, what ended up happening in the time was, I remember Drew Stone called me up because Marauder was going through some bad times. I guess a few members left, and that Five Deadly Venoms record was about to get released, but that was actually the pre-production demo for the record. That actually wasn't the record. Right. And um, and I was asked to join so that they could do a U.S. tour. I believe it was with Earth Crisis um, for that record, you know, to tr- try to help out with the hype. And uh, it was cool, man. I loved it. I already knew those guys. I've known those guys forever. They've been going to shows as long as I was. You know, I knew I knew Jorge before he was a Marauder and, and, and Saab, uh, you know, geez, I know Saab since I was probably 13 years old. So uh, I remember going to a. I was living, I want to say I was living in, in Jersey at the time with, with uh, my boy Loki. And um, what I ended up doing was I ended up staying at Saab's house for like two weeks to learn the music. And and then I went right out on tour, you know, for about two weeks with, uh, I believe it was Earth Crisis and Warzone. And uh, that was a good time. And I, I love that record. I actually, I was hoping that, with me and the band, we would have recorded a real version of that record, but, but there was too much, you know, there was too much uh, arguing going on in the band. The guys really weren't getting along. Uh, Jorge had left right after the tour, left the band and, uh, and Saab tried to uh, restart the band with Eddie singing, you know, and um, I think Eddie was a great vocalist. I mean, I love Eddie. But but I wasn't really interested in doing that like that type of like death metal type music with Eddie um, singing. I mean, you know, a kids love it these days. But at the time, I was like, oh, I don't know. I kind of want like a more harsher voice. And, you know, I really wanted to do it with Jorge. Um, so I ended up bowing out. And I think they ended up playing a few shows with Eddie. And um, like I said, you know, it seems I've heard from some people that that they like it as much as all the other versions of Marauder. So, I mean, who knew? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have a ear that good, right? Like I I like a big nice recording. You know, so it's it's so hard to compare anything to Master Killer. It is. Yeah, Master Killer is a masterpiece. You know, they yeah. they uh they went hard on that one, you know. They they went in there, you know, they had Paris produce the record. You know, you could tell there was a lot of attention to detail. Um those songs have been practiced and practiced and practiced. I mean, a lot of them were on the demos. So those guys knew what they were doing. Um, Five Deadly Venoms is good, but you could tell they weren't ready. Like that, that, like I said, that record was, that wasn't supposed to be the record. That was their demo. So I'm sure that had the band stayed together and they would have went into studio and actually recorded the record the right way as a record. Then you would have heard something at the caliber of Master Killer. But I think the label was like, hey, you know what? We're going to put out this demo because we haven't received the record from you guys yet. And this is going to be it, you know? Yeah, and it's four years later, right? So, like, there has to be some momentum that got killed. Yeah, exactly. You know, but imagine that. I mean, those there was good songs on that record. Um, really good with songs. With the right production, that would have been – that would have been – the last great Marauder record. <laughs> For sure. I mean, they're kind of like one of those big what if bands, right? Like what happens if Marauder does follow up Master Killer two years later with like a, a record that's like the same studio quality and they tour constantly? Like what, what do you think happens? I think the band would have got even bigger. 
you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, and they had Pokey on drums. Um, when I was in the band, we had Joe from Dark Side playing drums, which was still good. I mean, you know, if anything, maybe, you know, it was more of Joe's speed anyway because he was more into the metallic stuff. But I think Pokey did an amazing job on that demo. Um, and we had Mike from Candiria on bass, yeah. you know, which was great. He wasn't in Candiria yet. But he knew he was going to be already because he used to talk to me about it all the time. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah those first was... couple Candiria records are out of this world. Oh, yeah. And then those guys, I go back with those guys, too, because, you know, doing the death metal grindcore stuff with asphyxiation, you know, when I wasn't doing much hardcore, I was playing shows with Candiria all the time because they were playing more in the death metal circuit back then. You know, and it would be, uh, I remember, asphyxiation... Candiria and Human Remains. You know, we we we'd be playing a lot of bills together in the like in the local area. Beto, I don't want to go too much into your time in Madball because I want to do a whole episode on Hold It Down. Uh, I previously did a whole episode on Set It Off, and and I think that this is another one that we should give that treatment to because, like, I mean, it might be the best Madball record. You know, if 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 I didn't have sentimental value to like the first two, like, and I was looking at it objectively. It's probably the best. Where do you think it fits into to Madball's like catalog? Um, man, I mean, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm you know, and it's, I mean, of course, I'm biased. I'm, you know, I played on the record, but to me, it goes set it off, then it goes hold it down. That's my yeah. favorite Madball records, you yeah. know, and uh, and I'm 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 really proud of that record, you know, for a few reasons. I mean, I remember that. Like, I loved Look My Way, and those guys did too, but there was problems with, like, the production. You know, they weren't too happy with the way it came out. And uh, and we really didn't know what was going to happen with the band when I joined. It was one of those things where we were thinking, this might just be our last record. Um, and we were like, you know, let's make let's make it count. You know, let's make sure that that this record is freaking hard, you know? And... Uh, and I, I think we achieved it. I mean, I had, you know, I, uh, when we were writing it, there was times where I'm like, you know, it was nerve wracking because you're thinking, you're like, all right, I just joined this band and uh, I can't give them the first whack record. <laughs> you know <what> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be on the first whack record. I'm like, that would be terrible. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, Maddie was still there to help us out with it. You know, he produced it. He played second guitar on it with me and uh, he helped us out with a lot of the ideas on a lot of those songs, you know, and uh, I think together, you know, we, 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 you know, we ended up doing a really amazing record. The feel on it is phenomenal. We spent, I want to say, if I remember correctly, maybe 10 or 12 days on drums alone to get the feel. And it's not that, it's not that, that uh there was problems recording the drums it was just that it was one of those things where we figured let's get the feel right and then everything else is going to fall into place yeah. and that's exactly what happened i mean with guitars we spent maybe a day and a half um we didn't really go too crazy with the guitars or with the bass uh, most of the time i think was spent on on the feel of the record and I remember Freddie did his vocals twice. You know, he wasn't happy with his first take. He went back in there and killed it. And, uh, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm proud of it, man. I think it still sounds ferocious when I listen to it this day. Um, it's, uh, and it sounds freaking big. I mean, there's, there's four rhythm tracks constantly playing on that record and a fifth track for punches and, and like little overdubs. So it's crazy, crazy guitar freaking frequencies flying all over the place on every chord, you know? Yeah, but it doesn't get buried. Like everything, it doesn't sound like a sludgy mess, which can happen sometimes if you do too many guitar tracks. It, it's a spectacular record. We should get into it and dive into it another time because it's a record that it didn't come easy. You guys like had to work at it to make it, you know, what it is. And then it's like your work paid off and you really wrote a masterpiece, right? So Let's spend some time on it another time, but uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's real it. quick back up and and let's just talk about how you join Madball. So you do you join sometime like right after Look My Way comes out? I don't. Did you did you tour with them on that record? Because that's the first time I saw Madball. They came out here in '98, and I saw them in Santa Barbara and San Diego. 
on the look my way tour. Were you playing with them then? I was. I joined for for the touring cycle for Look My Way, but I think that right. those two shows might have been Matt Henderson. Um, yeah, yeah, he was still playing. I didn't know if he if it was a five piece. I couldn't remember. That was that Earth Crisis, Blood for Blood, and uh, Scarhead tour. Yeah, yeah. Maddie did a few of the the tours right in the beginning, and yeah. then uh, then he stepped down. I uh, I had already known that I was going to be in the band. You know, Maddie already knew. You know, he already had asked me to take over. Um, but, uh, what, what I did was I waited for them guys to come back home so that I could jam with them. We were jamming as a five piece in the studio. Cause, um, I didn't want to just learn the notes. I wanted to see how he played it, you know, all the nuances and all that stuff. So, so I would jam in the studio with him and then I, I, I jam just me and Maddie and, and I wanted to know, ex- Hey, do you rake this note or do you pick this note? Do you palm mute yeah. this note? Like, what are you doing? And, yeah. and I didn't want it to sound any different. And I'm sure, you know, it's still, you could probably pick out a few things that would sound different. But the main thing that I wanted was I didn't want the band to skip a beat. I wanted the band to sound like as close to Maddie still being there as possible. You know, uh, guitar sounds might be a little different. Like I, I'll say maybe I get like a little, maybe I use a little more saturation than he does, you know. But uh, as far as the playing, I wanted it to be as close to as possible to him. But um, right after, uh, you know, right after doing all those rehearsals with Maddie, then, you know, what I think the first thing I did was South America with those guys. Then I did a, a few U.S. tours, Japan, Australia, uh, Europe. Um, most of the touring for Look My Way was me, you know, and then by the time. You know, it, it's it's odd because then something similar happened with Hold It Down where I did a little bit of the touring, but then Mitz took over soon after, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how was it like writing a set list when you came in the band? Like how much did you want to play? Like what, what was your choice and what was your input into like a set list like coming off Look My Way coming out? I uh, I don't I didn't have too much of a of a input in what the set list would be. I mean, you know, here and there I would ask the songs. I remember the song, uh, and this is only on the deluxe edition of "Look My Way," but the song "Thinking to Myself," which we did on "Hold It Down," was I believe it came out as "Talking to Myself," and <laughs> we changed the name because it sounded weird. But uh-huh. that was on the deluxe edition of of "Look My Way," and I remember telling them I always wanted that on the set list, you know. Um, yeah. which I think we played a few times. I love that song. It just, to me, you know, kind of has like a weird killing time vibe to it that I like. Um, but, but I think the set list mainly stayed unchanged from the way it was when Maddie was in the band. Pretty much you the same want, set list. I want Streets of Hate on the set list every time. Like that verse is so brilliant. Like the single note. <laughs> Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that, yeah, that was always on the set list when I was in the band. Streets of yeah. Hate. Yeah. We love doing that. And that's, you know, that that's Mabel's victim in pain right there. <laughs> Dude, it's a 90 second song. The verse is one note. Like it's brilliant. Come on. That is right. And it's like Hoy always to say, he's like, yo, you can write, you know, you can write a song with one note. And I'd be, I'd be like, get out of here. And he was like, you know, proved it right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Uh, Beto, you've been great. Thanks so much for your time. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we get out of here? No, nah, man. No, nah, man. It's been great. Thanks for having me. wraps the pod everyone there will be a sub stack that's a companion piece that comes out tomorrow so you just go to 185 miles south dot substack dot com i'm writing there almost every week if not every other week so handle business also shoot me an email if you want to talk 185 miles south at gmail.com we don't talk about this much on the pod but i'm two years sober right now which is pretty fucking crazy And uh, if you're going through problems and stuff, you're a fan of the pod, I can talk to you about that, whatever you want to talk about. But get at me via email. Don't fucking DM me. What's going on, guys? But we are on the socials. It's 185 miles south on uh, Instagram, threads, Twitter, all that. But uh, if you want to get in touch with the pod, it's 185 miles south at gmail.com.
Handle Business. We love you all. We will talk to you again next Monday on Patreon. (laughs) 